In this chapter, we will be looking at two-dimensional art. This lecture is meant to accompany the reading you've already done in chapter one of your textbook. Two-dimensional art is made up of four different types of art, which include drawing, printmaking, painting, and photography. The first we're going to look at is drawing. Drawing is considered the foundation of all two-dimensional art and is divided into two groups. Dry media, which is made up of chalk, charcoal, pastel, graphite, and wet media, which is made up of pen and ink and wash and brush. We will look at each of these. The first is chalk. Chalk was developed in the middle of the 14th century. It is what's considered as a fairly flexible medium, meaning it can be manipulated through shading, mixing of tones, and then changing how light or dark the line is compared with how much pressure is applied. It does not need paper, as you can see from the image here, where we have a sidewalk chalk drawing, but it does need a rough surface. When we can talk about this with paper, we call that as having tooth in the paper, meaning the chalk needs something that it can grab onto. The next medium is charcoal. Charcoal is made from burnt wood, and it, like chalk, also needs a rough surface. Charcoal smudges very easily, and if you're going to do a drawing or a work in charcoal, when you're done, you'll have to fix it with something. That way, it will stop the smudging. Historically, charcoal was used for outlines, especially in frescoes and murals. The artist would go and draw lightly with charcoal and then would paint over it. In some works and some frescoes especially, you can still see some of the original charcoal markings. The next dry medium is what's called pastels. Pastels are basically chalk, but it's chalk that is combined with a pigment. These are available in a range of hardness to softness. You have soft, medium, and hard. The harder the stick, the less intense the color, meaning it leaves less on the paper. Soft pastels have the most intensive colors but are hard to work with. As you can see here, this work very bright colors, but the soft pastels tend to crumble and leave, works, leave resin behind. Also, like the other examples, you need a rough or a ribbed paper that is best. That way the, the pastels has something to grab onto. And like charcoal, when you're done, you need to spray it with a fixer. That way the work does not smudge. And then the last of the dry mediums is graphite. Much like coal, this is most commonly used as pencil lead. It also has varying degrees of hardness and softness. The harder it is, the lighter the mark. So when you were always told in tests to bring a number two pencil, the number two refers to the hardness of the actual graphite. Next, we're going to look at wet media. Wet media is made up of, again, pen and ink and wash and brush. This is an example of pen and ink. Pen and ink gives the artist more variation in line. Also, shading can be achieved by adding water to the ink, as you can see here. Here we have the outlines that are made with the pen, but the lighter gray shaded areas are created when the artist adds water to the ink. Also, with pen and ink, shading can be done by creating lines further or closer together. If you look on the figure's neck here, you can see the shadowing is created not as it is by adding water, but because we have very small lines that are closer together. The darkest parts of her hair are also created by shading. This is where the lines are so close together, we actually cannot tell them apart. The other form of wet media is what's called wash and brush. And this is where we dilute the ink with water and then it's applied with a brush. It's very similar to watercolor. This type of medium is very difficult to control and it dries very, very quickly. However, it has a level of fluidity to it that many artists like. This level of fluidity is not available, especially with things such as in dry media. You can see in the work here, as more water has been added, the pigment gets lighter, but you can see that sense of fluidity within the work. And much like watercolors with wash and brush, once you put a mark down on the surface, if you go back over it, it actually creates another tone.
You can also use these mediums together. This work is a combination. This is the Rape of Lucretia. And here you can see that we have pen, we have pastel, and we also have a brown wash all used within the same work. The, the next form we're going to look at is painting. And again, like drawing, we are going to explore this through the medium used. Painting, as I've mentioned in class before, is usually what we start classes with because it's the most popular and usually the form that most students are familiar with. Popular forms of paint are oils, watercolors, tempera, acrylics, and fresco. First, we have oil paints. Oil paints were developed around the 15th century in the Renaissance by Flemish artists. Oil paints are a combination of pigment and linseed oil. Why oil paints became so popular is they offered a great range of color possibility. And oil paints take a long time to dry. So you could actually work on blending different colors. If a mistake was made, it could be corrected. And artists were able to get much more detailed within the works itself. You can also show different texture within the work, be it physical, such as in Van Gogh's um, Starry Night that we've already looked at. This work here is an oil on canvas. It is Duchamp's nude descending, the descending a staircase number two. You can also see the dramatic effects you can get within the oil paints. This is a work by Caravaggio, a Baroque painter. And you can see here the very, very vibrant reds that are able to be created. And then the use of chiaroscuro, the shading with the light and the dark, which adds drama to the work. Also, you can see it within this work, this is where you can see some of that texture. When you look at the waves, you can almost see the brush stroke, something that you were able to achieve with oil paints that you would not been able to do with tempera paint. The next medium we're going to look at is watercolor. Your book defines watercolor as any color medium that uses water as a thinner. This is a very broad definition. Traditionally, watercolor refers to a transparent paint that is usually applied to paper. Again, this paper needs to be a thicker paper. If any of you have played around or have children have played around, if you try to use water paints on our typical computer printer paper, it doesn't hold. Just like chalk and pastel, it needs something to grab onto. Usually, thicker fiber-based papers are preferred for watercolors. Watercolors are usually preferred because they sent, tend to give the work a type of delicacy, as you can see in the image here. Watercolors, if you have ever worked with them, are actually very difficult to work with because once you have the color down, you cannot change it. If you try to paint over the original brush stroke, it actually darkens the color. However, watercolors can also be very vibrant, very dark. We can see here in this work, it is a landscape scene, and the greenery and the mountains seem very solid. This is used by using more pigment and very little color. Same is true in this work. This is also a watercolor, but even with the flame, we can get a sense of warmth in the bright colors that usually we're used to seeing with oil paints, but again, it can be achieved with watercolors, but you're using more pigment and very little water. Also, these can all be used in combination. What we have here is the artist went in and first drew more of the outline and the structures with pen, then went back in and added color and shading with watercolor. The next medium that we're going to look at is tempera. This is the paint that was used before, mainly before oil paints were produced. These are an opaque watercolor medium using very natural fibers, and it usually contains some sort of egg or egg-based wash. This was first used by the ancient Egyptians, where they ground pigments to add their colors. Tempera paints are very fast drying, so it makes it very hard to make any changes. It virtually eliminates any brush stroke within the work. This has its benefits that you can give very clear, sharp details. However, there is not time to make changes and you really can't mix any pigment on it. Another benefit is that it is very long lasting. The primary, this was again the primary method of painting until oil paints were developed. Also, tempera needs to be applied to a very smooth surface, usually wood 
or some, prepared, some sort of prepared plaster. This type of paint was very popular in the early Renaissance. And you can see in the image here, you were able to get some of the more vibrant colors, but still not as vibrant as was able to be achieved with oil paints. The next we have is what are called acrylics. Acrylics are a modern invention and they are a synthetic product. Acrylic paints, as you can see here, offers a wide variety of colors and shades. They are a water-based paint, however, they become water-resistant when dry. They dry fast and they also dry thin. And acrylics are resistant to cracking. They also adhere to a wide variety of surface and do not darken or yellow with age. When you go to Home Depot to get your paint to paint your house, acrylics are probably what you're going to be looking at. You can see the wide variety of colors available and even the different gloss, the different finishes that can be added to them. And then finally we have fresco. Fresco is a wall painting technique where pigments are mixed or applied to flat, fresh, fresh plaster, making the work literally part of the wall. So what happens is usually you would have a wall that was created with plaster, and then you would have this thin layer called the intaco layer, I-N-T-O-N-A-C-O. And within this layer, a light plaster would be mixed with the actual pigment, the paint of it, and apply to the heavier, thicker layer of plaster already there. Again, thereby making the work part of the wall. The work that you're looking at here is Diego Rivera's Man Controller of the Universe. This work was commissioned by Rockefeller to be put into the lobby of his building. Rockefeller, an American capitalist. Where Diego Rivera himself was actually more of a communist or a socialist in practice. And so what he included in this work, you can actually see linen pictured in it. As you're looking at the image, where you see the X of the wings, if you will, on the right hand side, the man in the suit with the blue tie is linen. Well, of course, Rockefeller, a proponent of capitalists, did not want linen to be shown in the lobby of his building. So since this was a fresco, meaning it literally was part of the wall, what happened was Rockefeller had people go in in the middle of the night and actually destroy the entire wall, so the work was destroyed. Um, Diego Rivera did recreate this work, and it is now a fresco in Mexico City. Here you can also see this technique. This is another fresco by Diego Rivera, and these are in Detroit, Michigan. These are at the, actually, um, Henry Ford commissioned these. And you can see within the work, literally, they are part of the wall. And again, Rivera is putting his ideals within the work, that it's supposed to celebrate the idea of man and machine. However, how he has this structured, it's showing that man is either just part of the machine or is even considered less than the machine. Another wonderful example of fresco is the Arena Chapel, in, or otherwise known as the Scriveni Chapel. And here the entire room is painted as a fresco. The different panels tell the life of Mary and then the life of Christ. All of this is painted. Even the parts that look like they are architectural elements are actually part of the fresco. And then probably one of the most popular, most well-known, is the Sistine Chapel. Here we are seeing the entire Sistine Chapel, including the lower frescoes by Peruguino and Botticelli, the ceiling painted by Michelangelo, and even on the far wall, the Last Judgment painted by Michelangelo. The link you have here is actually a virtual tour of the Sistine Chapel. So if you want to go, you can explore this and you can get a very close-up and detailed look at all of the work. Next, we have what's called mixed media. Mixed media is exactly what it sounds like. It is a mixture of materials. If you click on this YouTube link here, it'll take you to a short video which talks about the piece you see here, which is Robert Rauschenthal's Bed, 1955. Here you have a variety of medias. We literally have a blanket and a pillow which has been painted on. What happens in mixed media is an artist combines various medium in order to create a work that allows the artist to transcend limits of a single medium. Mixed medium has always been around, but it became very popular in the early and mid-1900s with the, with the change into modernist art.
The next medium that we're going to look at is what's called printmaking. A print is a hand-produced image that's transferred from a printing service to a piece of paper or some other medium. Usually they are numbered, but you have an issue number or an edition number. Because in most printmaking formats, you can create multiple prints. If an artist wants to add a unique value to their print, they'll number them in addition that give them addition numbers, and then afterwards they will actually destroy the printing block or the original print. That way no other prints can be made from that. There are three main types of printing. We have relief printing, intaglio, and the planographic process. The first is what's called relief printing. This is what's known as woodcut, wood engraving, and linoleum cut. Here there is also a clip that you can look at which shows you how this is actually created. Your book explains it, and I'll go into a little detail, but it makes more sense when you actually see it. What happens in this, in relief printing, is that you have your surface, and then you actually cut away the non-image areas. The areas that are left are raised, and then they are inked, and then that is pushed into a paper. Think of it as a rubber stamp. The part that actually stamp is the raised stamp. What you're looking at here is a work by Albert Durer. This is the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse, and again, this is a woodcut. Next, we have the intaglio process, which includes etching, dry point, and aquatint. In this process, the artist transfers ink to paper from grooves cut into the metal plate. This is the opposite of relief printing, where it was the raised surface that had the ink on it. In the intaglio process, it's actually the grooves that the ink is down in. The first we have is called line engraving, and this is where we cut grooves into a metal plate with special sharp tools. This is able to produce very, very precise images. However, it's the most difficult to do. If you make a mistake on this, you can ruin the entire work. Next, we have what's called etching. This is where the artist covers the plate with a thin, wax-like, acid-resistant substance, which is usually called ground. Then, the artist scratches away parts to produce the desired lines, then immerses the plate in an acid bath. The process can be repeated and areas can be reco re recovered to produce different shades. Again, here's a short YouTube clip where you can watch this and see the etching process. Next, we have dry point. In dry point, the printmaker scratches the surface of a metal plate with a needle. This can leave behind a ridge or a burr on either side of the groove. And here you can see different examples of the line. You can see here clearly etched lines, very clean and precise. Examples of dry point, we could have much thicker, much fuzzy, furrier lines, if you will. And on the bottom, you can see examples of lines made with a burr. The burr is what we call it when there's only one side of the groove has that fuzzier, softer feeling to it. And the last we have is what's called aqua tent, and this is very good for creating a shadowy area. Page 46 of your book describes this in detail, however, I've also provided a link to a YouTube video. This video will help you see the very, very detailed process that Aquatint goes through. However, within this, you can see why some artists use it because the level of depth and the level of detail you can get within the work. And then here are just some more examples. These are examples of engraving. This again is a work by Albert Durer. And then you can see the details here, how detailed he can get in the work. And then this is an example of an etching, and this was actually created by Rembrandt. The next form of printing that we have is what's called the planographic process. This is made up of lithography, silkscreen, stenciling, and monoprinting. Within this, the artist prints from a plane or a surface. Within lithography, you use a porous stone, usually limestone, something very abundant here in Kentucky. And what happens is you draw the image on the stone with a greasy substance. The more grease you have, the darker the image. From that, you press that onto the paper or whatever surface, and that creates your print. Again, there is a link to a YouTube video where you can see this process. The next is silk screening. This is the most common of the stencil processes. What happens in silk screening is you have a finely meshed silk fabric that is mounted on a wooden frame. 
Non-image areas are blacked out. That means the paint can only go through where you want it to. Ink or paint is applied, and then the squeegee is pushed down the screen, and it forces the ink or the paint onto the openings that, onto the surface that you want them. This is most often known, we almost all of us own this, silk screening is what's used in many of the processes to create the prints on t-shirts that we all wear every day. Again, I have attached a YouTube video where you can see this process in detail. And then finally, we have what's called the monotype or the monoprint. This, this process is where you apply ink to a flat surface and transfer it onto a paper. This sounds like many of the other processes. However, with monotype or monoprint, mono means one. You are actually only able to produce one print from this type. And again, here's a YouTube video where you can go and actually see this process. Just like the other mediums that we've looked at, these techniques can be com combined and are not always easily determined what source we are looking at. And then finally, we're going to look at photography. Man has always wanted to visually record his or her world. We can see this from the first paintings that we've discovered, the cave paintings. In these, images were captured of everyday parts of life, for example, a hunt. We look at photography and we assume it gives us information about the world. Especially earlier photography, the idea was that it actually captured the world as it was. Throughout this part of the lecture, we're going to look at different types of photography, from straight photography developed by Alfred Stieglitz to documentary photography, and then we'll also talk about some different photographic techniques, including the rule of thirds and the golden ratio. The rule of thirds is a way of, comp of composing specific images. What you do with this is as you're looking through your field, so if you have, you're holding a camera up and you're looking to capture the image, you actually break both horizontally and vertically, you break the film into, you break the viewing area into thirds, creating nine different squares. The idea is that you do not want to capture your main focal point always in dead center. What you want to do is have the main point of interest actually on one of these lines of the thirds. And this creates a much more dynamic work. Also, we have the idea of what's called the golden ratio. And this is looking at proportions. The golden ratio is 1 to 1.618. This ratio the human eye sees as ideal within a work. Again, let's return to this idea as photography as record, especially earlier photography. When photography was first invented, the idea was that it captured the world as it really is. However, we know nowadays it's very easy to manipulate photography, especially with the advent of digital photography. Think about on your phone how many different ways that you can change an image. I mean, just using Snapchat, for example. But at the time, this was not considered. So what we see here, this is a photograph by Matthew Brady, who was very famous for photographing the Civil War, and that's what this image was. Again, the idea was that photography created a record, that it created and showed the world as it actually was. However, this is not exactly true. Photographs at this time took a long time to process, and Brady would actually stage the photographs how he wanted him. He didn't just happen to stumble upon this moment. He was known to move bodies around where he wanted them, and then the living figures in the distance, the person on horseback and the two men standing, were also clearly placed by Brady within the work. So even older photographs that we consider truer, if you will, are often also manipulated. All right, next we're going to talk about Ansel Adams. Ansel Adams, very famous American photographer. He was part of a group called the F64 group. And if you know about cameras, F64 is actually the smallest aperture setting on a lens, meaning it's, the lens itself is almost closed and just very little light can get into the, into the, onto the film. What this does is this gives you a very deep depth of field, meaning that almost the entire image is in clear detail. And you can also get very close to works, as we'll see here shortly with imaging Cunningham. 
Well, what happens with Ansel Adams was Ansel Adams looked at photography as an art form. And he struggled with the idea because even in his time, people still didn't consider photography. Well, some people didn't consider photography art. Why? Because they thought anybody could pick up a camera and snap an image. And you can see this in the quote I have here. Adam said, I have often thought if photography were difficult in the true sense of the term, meaning that the creation of a single photograph would entail as much time and effort as the production of a good watercolor or etching, there would be a vast improvement in total output. The sheer ease with which we can produce a superficial image often leads to creative disaster. We must remember that a photograph can hold just as much as we put into it, and no one has ever approached the full possibilities of the medium. And he stated this in his book, The Art of Photography. Think about what he said. This is said back in the early, mid-1900s. Think about this idea even today. Many of you had made comments about photography, some photography not being art, because anybody can go snap a picture. That's not a new idea. And we're still talking about with Adams, this is people working with film photography and developing prints in the darkroom. Next, we're going to look at another member of the F64 group. This is Imogen Cunningham, and you can see her work here, Magnolia Blossom. Within this work, you can see how close and how detailed she was able to get to the flower. And so it almost seems that the flower becomes something different, almost a sculpture within itself. Next, we're going to look at the photography of Cindy Sherman. Again, Cindy Sherman, very famous photographer, but she was famous for doing self-portraits. Every single one of these images is actually of her. And she had different storylines that she would create. What she would do in one series was that she actually created famous scenes from movies where she dressed herself up as the main characters. A consistent theme in Sherman's work was that she sought to raise and challenge um, the important questions about the role and the representation of women in society, the media, and the nature and creation of art. Next, we're going to look at what's called straight photography. This was developed in the early 20th century by Alfred Stieglitz. What Alfred Stieglitz did, and this is actually an image of Stieglitz here, was instead of looking at art as photography as an art form to be manipulated, what straight photography claims is that you should capture an image exactly how it is. And it's the composition of the work that's important, not what tricks you can do within a darkroom. You can see that in his image here. This is a photograph that he took actually of his wife, Georgia O'Keeffe. This is an example of straight photography. This has, this has not been manipulated any way. Also, you can see this in another image of his. What makes this work so interesting, again, it's not been lightened, dark, and shaded within the dark room, but it's the composition of the work. We're looking at passengers on a boat, and we can clearly see with the lines, the structure of the ship, we can see the different markings between the social classes, that we have the uppers on top and the lower classes on the bottom. Next, we're going to look at what's called documentary photography. Documentary photography started in the late 1800s. And the idea with a documentary is a documentary claims to show a truth. However, all of these documentaries have a specific message. The same is true for documentary film today. There is some sort of message behind the work. Probably one of the most famous of the documentary photographers in the United States was Dorothea Lang, who you can see here sitting on top of her car. Dorothea Lang was actually employed by the United States government during the Great Depression. And what happened was FDR was trying to get his works progress um, projects passed. And so what he wanted was he wanted photographers to go out across the United States and capture images of the hardships that people were actually facing. That way, when those people back in the more populated cities could see how others were suffering, the idea was then that they would then pass the required legislation for help. This was actually very widely successful, and mainly because of this image here. This became the iconic image of the Great Depression. This was taken by Dorothea Lang, and it's called Migrant Mother 1936. What happened in this 
And she was actually out, um, she was out in California and she was going to take uh, photographs of people, migrant workers, basically workers who were traveling to where there were jobs. And the moment she came, she drove past these people on the road and she just couldn't get this, their image out of her mind. And so she turned around and went back. And what happens is you see this young mother here with her children. They had traveled to the area because they had been told that there was work. There was work picking, I believe it was peas in a field. Well, there was a sudden frost and the crop died, so there was no work. What they actually had just done, they had a car and they had just sold the tires off the car for money so they could feed their family. So now they are literally stuck on the side of the road. And this is the moment that Lang captures. However, what's very interesting within this work is that even though this is supposed to be documentary photography, this is not just a scene she stumbled upon. She actually had them sit this way, and so she staged this photo to be how she wanted. There are many different images of this, and you can actually see in some, there's one where a thumb kind of sticks out, and it has been edited out. Dorothea Lange also was very important for her documentary photography during World War II with the internment of the Japanese Americans. Since she was still working for the American government and had been so successful in her work during the Great Depression, the government sent her back in to the internment camps. This is where those of Japanese American descent on the western coast were told to relocate to internment camps. And they thought, well, if we have her go in and document how these camps are, they'll see that these individuals are being treated fine and fairly. However, Dorothea Lang herself was actually very, very against the camps. And she went in and would take the photographs, but she was trying to show the camps as she claimed as how they really were, to show that these were not nice places, these were people who were not happy here, and she wanted the American public to see this. However, since she still worked for the government at the time, she did not own her work, and many of her photographs were never published. The book cover that you can see here, called Impounded, these were years later um, because of the Freedom of Information Act where her photographs finally were able to come to light and she was finally able to pu publish these works. Another important artist is Diane Arbus. Um, she lived 1923 to 1971. She again was an American photographer noted for her black and white square photos. And what was interesting about her is that she liked to look at what was considered others. People that were considered deviant or marginalized people such, such as dwarfs, giants, transgender people, nudists, circus performers, or any people whose normality seemed ugly or surreal. She believed that the camera could be a little bit cold, a little bit harsh, but its scrutiny revealed the truth, the difference between what people wanted others to see and what they really did see, the flaws. So you can see here in this image, this is, you know, boy with hand grenade. This was just an image, she stumbled upon this young boy playing in the park, and he has a toy grenade in his hand. Yet that moment she captures him, he seems to be almost something other. You see this again in this image of identical twins. There's something other, almost creepy about them, if you will. And this, we're looking at a cross-dressing man. This is man in curlers. And so at the time, these were people that were considered outside, considered marginalized. Arbus herself said that she was afraid that she would get to be known as the photographer of the freaks. Um, and she did not want that, that what she was trying to do was to show the beauty in the flaws and the flaws that we all have. However, sadly enough, that phrase has been often used to describe her and her works. This was something that weighed heavily on her, and actually in 1971, she committed suicide for these reasons. That concludes our look at two-dimensional two art. Please make sure you have already read the chapter because this lecture is just meant to supplement that information.